Thank you for joining us for today's Focus on Variant Classification EQA's webinar, jointly presented by myself, Farah Kwaja, and my colleague, Mark Sales. We are both deputy directors working for GenQA. I specialize in molecular genetics and Mark in cytogenomics. Our team were very excited because the recent European Society of Human Genetics conference took place on our home ground, Scotland, UK. GenQA held several workshops at our stand. Today's webinar is an overview of one of the variant workshops presented. At the conference, we also launched a new genomic online individual education suite of training modules called Genie. More about that later. GenQA is part of the UK NEQAS consortium, and although we are based in the UK, we are global UCAS accredited EQA providers with over 90% of our participants from out with the UK. We understand our webinar audience include individuals with a range of genetic expertise. However, just to cover all bases, I like to go back to basics. What are variants? Variants are changes to the DNA sequence or chromosomal structure. Single nucleotide variants is a change to a single nucleotide in the DNA sequence. Copy number variants is gain or loss of multiple nucleotides due to a change in the chromosomal structure. There are multiple classification systems available for different variant types. These are quantitative, evidence-based scoring frameworks that encourage consistency and transparency, allowing a standardized approach. The same variant can be assigned different classes by different laboratories, which can lead to issues for familial follow-up. In line with guidelines, there are five categories of variant classification. Class 1 is benign, class 2 likely benign, class 3 is for variants of uncertain significance, class 4 likely pathogenic, and class 5 pathogenic. GenQA has provided laboratory-based pathogenicity EQAs for more than 10 years. The EQAs cover postnatal and prenatal constitutional variants, hematological and somatic variants, as well as germline sequence and RNA splicing variants. In the pathogenicity of germline sequence variants EQA, there was a variation of classification systems used by participants. This pie chart shows how some participants used a single classification system and others a combination. There can be multiple routes to classify variants, which in a real diagnostic situation could result in a misclassification. This is an overview of how seven of the 2013 EQA variants were reported. The larger the bubble, the more participants there were that reported that particular classification. As you can see, there is a significant variation in the classifications reported. Of note, the variant in green, which was a class 5 pathogenic variant, was reported by some as a class 4, which may not have a difference with respect to clinical management. However, some laboratories have reported this as a class 3 or even a class 2, which is likely benign. Conversely, in purple, one of the variants has been classified as a class 1 also as a class two, also as a class three, and as a class four. Now there's quite a bit of diff difference between a class one and a class four. Now fast forward to several years of GenQA having provided this EQA, and you can see a major improvement. So the 2013 variants just discussed are slotted in this bubble plot. However, there are less red dots, or at least the red dots are smaller, meaning the less laboratories have reported an incorrect classification in the more recent years of providing this EQA. There are still the odd variant with variation, like 2021 splice sites, but no longer are you seeing a class five being classed as a class two, for example. Now over to Mark. Thank you, Farah. We've been running the pathogenicity of postnatal CMV EQA since 2020. The laboratories use either the ACMG guidelines or their own classification to assign the CMV pathogenicity. This is submitted via a form on our website. We look at three things. The first is the accuracy of the CMV classification, classes one to five. The second is we examine how evidence is used to submit a clinical significance classification. 
And the third is we ask whether the laboratories would report the CNV. As you can see from the diagram, the number of critical classification errors has fallen over the years. However, the clinical significance is still problematic. This is likely due to laboratories not uncoupling the classification from the phenotype. It also sometimes depends on the particular CNVs for that year, and the guidelines can be difficult to apply. I'm now going to present the same CNV in both a postnatal and later on in a prenatal setting. Here we have a CNV that is to a neurodevelopmental locus. The loss seen here includes one omin morbid gene, NIPA1. However, this gene is reported with incomplete penetrance of about 8 to 10% and variable expressivity. The CMB should be classified as pathogenic, but depending on the evidence used, may also be classified as likely pathogenic or as a VUS. All three were accepted for this EQA. The incorrect classification shown in the bubble plot is for classifying the CNV as benign. As this is the mother of Helen, the clinical significance is negligible. The incorrect clinical significance classifications were caused by either not uncoupling the classification from the phenotype, or perhaps by mistaking that they were reporting on the baby. For pathogenicity of prenatal variants, we've only run two EQAs so far. Again, laboratories use either the ACMG guidelines or their own classification, and we again look at the accuracy of the CMV classification, how the evidence is used to assign clinical significance, and whether the CMV would be reported. We have seen similar issues to those seen in the postnatal pathogenicity EQAs, but with the added complication that the phenotype might not always be apparent on ultrasound, making the clinical significance difficult to establish at times. As we've only done two EQA so far, we have limited data, but it appears that there is the same variability in the use and application of the ACMG guidelines in the prenatal setting. For some CMVs, classification can be difficult, so multiple classifications are accepted. It should be again noted that the ACMG guidelines recommend the uncoupling of the CMV classification from the clinical significance. And clinical significance itself may be hard to determine in the prenatal setting due to limited phenotypic information. Therefore, again, multiple classifications are often accepted. Here we present the same 15Q CMV as discussed for postnatal. It is a maternally inherited CMV overlapping the region of recurrent loss. It involves the NIPA1 neurodevelopmental locus that is known to have incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. There are a limited number of prenatal case reports with structural anomalies detected by ultrasound. However, there is no clear association and the non-specific fetal anomalies presented in this case cannot be confidently attributed to this CNV. Multiple clinical significant classifications are accepted with the sole critical error being given to a participant that stated that the CNV was wholly responsible for the phenotype. It could be that this participant hasn't uncoupled the CMV classification from the clinical significance. So now a brief summary. Each of the variant EQAs has shown improvement in the variant classification as time has gone on. Accurate classification is essential to ensure the patient receives the correct result and appropriate clinical management is given. It's obvious that there is variability in the use and application of the guidelines and this needs to be looked at for the future. There is a continued need for EQAs to educate and promote standardisation, and the guidelines require expansion and improvement. And it's known that joint CNV SNV guidelines are currently in development. And now back to Farah. Thanks, Mark. So the classification EQAs available were laboratory based. There was a need for individual assessment and competency checking. You spoke, we listened. And at the ESHG conference on 10th of June, we launched Genie.
Genie, Genomic Online Individual Education Platform, is a comprehensive suite of training modules. It allows individuals to showcase their expertise and illustrate their continued professional development, CPD. Initial training modules include SNV and CNV classification. On completion of the assessment, all participants receive an individual report which summarizes their classification, including the expected classification and criteria, as well as a certificate of participation. The free trial for classification of SNVs and CNVs is still available until the 31st July. To enrol, log on to www.genqa.org and click on Genie. Once you've logged in, select whether it will be the CNV or SNV variants you'd like to classify. And in the trial version, there are three variants. You will be provided with all the information you require for the variant, the referral reason, testing performed, and then you enter the evidence criteria. Once you've made your assessment of the variant, enter the classification and submit. Genie can be purchased as an individual via PayPal or through your laboratory. As previously mentioned, upon completion, you will receive a performance report. This will include the expected criteria and evidence. You will also receive a certificate of participation, which provides details of which module you undertook and not any scores, because the purpose of Genie is to help evidence your continued professional development. Once again, thank you for joining us in today's webinar and we hope you found it useful. Feedback is welcome. A survey will be sent to registered participants following this webinar. The webinar will also be available to view on our GenQA YouTube channel, so please subscribe. Automated participation certificates will be sent out. To receive details of upcoming webinars and other events, please sign up to the GenQA newsletter using the button on our website at www.genqa.org. Thank you.